Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vinarandum video cast. Today, we are talking about Suave and, in particular, the new crew system for Suave wine. And I'm very pleased to be joined by some guests, um, two Chiaras, um, one from the Consorzio of Suave and uh, Chiara Coffole, um, uh, winemaker and winery owner. Again, we have Ola Udsen, a Danish wine importer. And we're also joined by Matteo Inama of the famous Inama Estate and Julia Franchetto of Cantina Franchetto. So welcome, everybody. Hi. Thank you. Thank Hello. You. Hello. Hi. Uh, ciao, ciao. So uh, if I could just ask Matteo, if you want to start, could you just, you know, 15 seconds, tell us for anyone who doesn't know already about your, your winery, um, about yourself? Uh, yes, we are a um, family estate, Azienda Agricola, which means that uh, we produce... Uh, uh, wines for, with uh, our vineyards. Just behind me, there is actually a map of the Suave and uh, of uh, our plots. And uh, we've been producing wine for three generations, uh, especially in the Suave Classico, which is the old area of uh, the Suave. And uh, this area is mainly volcanic. Okay, fabulous. Thank we you. Produce, uh, we now produce like a, a crew from two areas instead of one. So you can try from Inama actually two crew uh with very different characteristics which we're going to talk uh, about later yes brilliant thank you very much julia if you could hello everyone yes <laughs> i am julia and i am a winemaker i am the second generation of my winery uh, who was started by my father in 1982. Uh, we are located in the very eastern part of the suave area uh, and uh, we are characterized by also Matteo, uh, that also Matteo talked about, uh, the volcanic, volcanic soil, so very red soil, but we will talk better later about this characteristic. Okay, brilliant. Uh, Chiara? Yes, Coffele. I'm uh, Chiara Coffele, and uh, I run uh, the winery, the Coffele winery, together with uh, my brother, who is uh, actually the real winemaker. Uh, so I'm not a winemaker, I'm a wine drinker more. <laughs> Uh, the winery is based in uh, Castelcerino, so it's a small hamlet uh, in the Suave Classico Hills uh, at uh, around 400 meters above the sea level. And uh, most of our soil is uh, uh, um, calcareous, so it's white. So I think it's uh, what uh, makes uh, our wines uh, a bit different uh, compared to also the other two wineries that are here today. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And Chiara, do you want to introduce your position at the Consortia? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm the Marketing Communication Manager for the Consortia of Suave. And uh, I love Suave uh, since a lot of years. Maybe all my, all my drinker history is here. So uh, I fall, felt in love. My husband say that I love Suave more than him. And uh, I say, yes, you're right. <laughs> brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. So for anyone tuning in who... Um, maybe isn't aware of Suave or, or perhaps is has a certain impression of Suave that may um, no longer be the, the whole story. Um, we can say that you know Suave is a, is a white wine produced in an area in northeast Italy between uh, Verona and Vicenza. It's, I like to think of it personally as a, a little bit of a, an L shape, the, the vertical bit going up towards the, the right. Um, there is obviously the, the Classico area that many producers refer to as the historic hilly area of the of the Appalachian, but but I think Suave is far more now than just the Classico system, especially with this with the introduction of this crew system. Um, so I'd like to really just start by talking about what the crew system is and um, how it came to be, and you know we, that should hopefully lead us nicely into a discussion about the. The terroir and the different sites. Um, Matteo, do you want? I, I believe you were fairly influential um, in, the, in the process back in 2000 uh, where, when, the, when, when, when the process of creating the Suave crew system began. Really, it's been a long journey from then to here, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it has been a long journey. Journey, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the crews are existing uh, since a uh, long time. Uh, they are now official and they have uh, been uh, identified with uh, very precise uh, perimeters. Um, now all the producers can uh, 
speak even more about uh, what's happening now in the Suave and there's uh, so many labels uh, that uh, wine lovers can try. So through these uh, different uh, wines you can really feel the different characteristics of the this ancient area. I'd also like to bring in Ola, who I've shame, shamefully forgot to, to introduce. Um, you, the, we should say, shouldn't we, Ola, there's 33 um, official vineyard sites now. Um, they, they've yeah. been going, I think they, they would have been established, they would have been released from um, this summer. So the first vintage would have been 2019. So... Uh, Suave is, of course, an area that has historical significance in many ways. Uh, it, it basically uh, ha has been famous for making great wine since uh, since late Roman times, uh, and uh, and probably made great wine before that because it, it does great wine doesn't happen of its own, of course. And then uh, and then uh, also uh, uh, Suave is important because its main grape variety, Garganega, is one of the sort of founder grape varieties of Italy. Uh, it's, it's the same as the Greganico Dorato of Sicily, and, and, and it basically is the parent of many, many other grape varieties, and, 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 and it's one of the very original Italian grape varieties, according to DNA research. So in, in this area, with a very, very long tradition, it's, it's actually uh, wonderful to see that now we have a classification of, of the various uh, top vineyards, uh, etc. Uh, Suave has many different soils, in fact. Uh, it has sort of a core around uh, Suave Castelcerino, where you have very calcareous soils. And as, as you were saying, Julia, uh, towards the east, you have more vol volcanic soils. Once you get down to the bottom of the valleys, you get more clay soils and, and, and heavier soils uh, just in general. Uh, but you do encounter those in some of the hills as well, a little bit further towards the west. So... Um, uh, so there is clearly the basis for a very great variation of vineyards and vineyard expressions, a grape variety that has been in the area for a long, long time. Um, there is also the Trebbiano di Suave, which is very closely related to the Verdicchio, which also gives excellent, excellent um, uh, terroir uh, expression elsewhere. Uh, so you, you clearly have a, a great conjunction of um, factors that make it possible to have a a really interesting and meaningful um, vineyard expression and uh, vineyard uh, division uh, in the area. And I'm excited that, that this work has been done now. Um, I'm sure it will elevate the, the, the level of, of, uh, of Suave in, uh, in people's minds because they now get to understand not just the history, but also uh, that, there is, uh, that there are reasons for the very different expressions that Suave can have. So it's it's uh, it's quite something, I think. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, I think some of these wines have been have been using these single vineyards for for many years. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to bring Matteo on today um, was because his Foscarino uh, site and of course his uh, Carbonara site is um, you know has been has been on their labels for many years. Um, you know. I, not necessarily fair to say they are the pioneers of the cruise system, but they're certainly one of, of a group of, of producers that I think have led the charge in, in putting um, the terroir of Suave and, it, and its complexities, you know, at the forefront of, of this new era of communication. So I'll, I'll move to Chiara at the Consortio. Would you like to, um, would you like to position our three, um, our three, crews of focus that we want to to talk about today yes if we want we <laughs> can move uh, on the crew map okay okay brilliant uh, that i have, I have uh, here so this is the the suave area as you said is a l okay so it, the, the city of verona is on the on the west and then on the east we have vicenza here there's a classical area there are 28 crews here Three crews are on the western part in, in this region, so it's a calcareous one. And then we have the two volcanoes, Calvarina and Crocetta, and then the Duello, there are the other uh, two crews on the eastern area. So this is less than the 38% of the surface of the, uh, of the appellation. So it's, uh, it was a selection only on the best spots we have. 
And uh, so we will talk about the Castelcerino crew that is in the higher part, uh, I guess part of this, uh, the classical area. Uh, then we go through the Poscarino that is in the middle here and the Carbonara that are closed. Here is an ancient volcanic cone. And then we have the menu area where Julia is, is Ronca, but we are going to talk more about Terrossa uh, in the Italian means red earth. So we are going through the different soils of Suave. So we talk about the hardware uh, before, and uh, I want just to show <laughs> this kit that we have. There are the Suave, Suave soils, yeah. the colors of Suave. So we have the white, yellow, red, and black soil. And that's like a huge difference for us. Fabulous. Okay, so... Um... Foscarino is obviously one of the central vineyards um, of of the the hilly area in the in the centre of the Appalachian. Julia, you're you're further to the east, aren't you? Yes. Um, tell us about your crew. Okay. Uh, as I said in the presentation, we are uh, in the very eastern part of the denomination, um, in the in the borderline between Verona and Vicenza province. Uh, our crew, which is called Ronca Monte Calvarina, is the largest geographical unit of the Suave uh, wine, um, but uh, it is not the most densely planted. In fact, we have uh, more or less uh, the 30% of the, the soil covered by vineyards, and all the rest are um, is covered by from a lot of woods. So we have also a very particular, a very particular um, landscape. So very natural and wild in some places. We have vineyards, woods, vineyards, woods. So it is really particular. Uh, it is also a very unique zone because uh, because of the exposures. Uh, the major part, the most part of the vineyards are exposed to southwest. So the vineyards. Uh, are in front of the sun for the major part of the day. And then because of the slopes uh, that are quite important in some areas and the altitude, uh, some vineyards arrive also to five, 500 meters on the level of the sea. As was said, uh, already said, our crew uh, is the biggest the, the, in, in air, like area, uh, but we we are together uh, two different areas, uh, smaller areas, we could say, which are Monte Calvarina, uh, which is the um, most important mount that we have, uh, which is um, also the biggest uh, volcano, uh, volcano that we have in the Suave area. And then the Monte Crocetta, which is the second one, uh, that it is where I personally have my vineyards, and Monte and then Duello, which is a smaller crew, very close to us, but from the same area. So we can say that uh, the most uh, mm, recent, but it's definitely not recent, volcanoes of the Suave area are located in this crew. So here we really found black and red soil. Uh, black comes um, Arctic rocks, um, which is the main soil that we have in, in this part of the valley. We are in the Val d'Alpone here. Uh, why? Where I live, where I have the vineyards personally, so in the Monte Crocetta, we have a little bit different soil, so very red, red color. Uh, also, the name of the village is Terrosa, Rossa, which means red land in English because of this soil. Um, and it did, probably this is probably uh, it is uh, red because of the presence of iron in the soil, which is really really important. And this uh, characteristic then goes to give a very big footprint uh, to the wine because it leaves to the grapes and then of course the wine uh, a very mineral a very minerality in the mouth. So we have wines that also we maintain this characteristic for many many years. Uh, for, for a very long time, so very particular, and I love this characteristic because 
Uh, we also personally work only with stainless steel tanks, so we don't use wood to age our wines because we want to preserve um, the characteristics that comes from the, the vineyards. We said Garganega is a fantastic grape. We are producers of, and we work with Garganega, but I think really definitely that uh, it's one of the best white grapes that we have in Italy and also very versatile. And, and, and very, very quickly, how many hectares is your, is your crew? Uh, I don't remember exactly the, the do you remember the hectares? Chiara at the consortium says, is that, that's planted hectares, right? Rather than the actual size of the yes, designated because it, territory. It's bigger, it's bigger in, the, in, the, in the surface. But mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, we can say that Castelcerino and Ronca, even if Ronca is a, is a double size of Castelcerino, but it has the same number of hectares, or maybe Castelcerino is more vine than Ronca. So, it, yes, we need to make the, the, the borders, the geographical border, but the, the surface is completely different. Only, only the 30% of the, the soil, the area is covered yeah. by the vineyards. So we really have a very, very particular landscape with a lot of woods. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And Chiara um, Kofale, if I can invite you to tell us about uh, Castelcerino, the, the other crew of focus today. Yes, sure. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, all of our vineyards uh, in that uh, single vineyard, <laughs> we can see. Um, so, um, all of our vineyards uh, are based uh, in Castelcerino. And um, my father has been uh, one of the first uh, brave ones uh, to uh, plant uh, some vineyards uh, in uh, that area and uh, when he actually started uh, to work uh, uh, to replant the vineyards uh, that were of my mother's family um, everyone uh, told him uh, that uh, he would uh, ever obtain uh, any good wines from there <laughs> uh, but uh, fortunately he went on with uh, his uh, ideas and um, indeed, uh, one of the biggest problems he had uh, when he replanted uh, the vineyards uh, was that uh, the soil was uh, so rocky that uh, he could not uh, actually make uh, any holes <laughs> even. Um, and uh, when he talks about uh, those times, uh, so we, we are talking about uh, the beginning of uh, the 80s, um, he said that uh, he would need uh, dynamite to uh, destroy the rocks. Uh, but uh, at that time, uh, it was uh, forbidden to buy dynamite uh, because of uh, the uh, Brigate Rosse that were uh, a, <laughs> a sort of uh, mafia in Italy. I don't know how to explain it, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> Terrorist so, group, I guess, is the name. <laughs> so that's uh, how to describe, uh, I guess, uh, the best way to describe our soil. And of course, then uh, uh, much more important uh, or very important is also uh, the altitude. Uh, because we also arrived to almost uh, 400 meters above the sea level. And uh, with the altitude, uh, we have uh, the lack of uh, having uh, the wind. Uh, so the presence of the wind is uh, very important uh, for many different reasons. Yes, so we have uh, 25 hectares uh, there, all terraced, uh, and they have been all terraced uh, by my father. Uh, planted mostly on uh, with, uh, of course, Garganega and uh, a small part of uh, Trebbiano di Suave. Okay. I guess and, it's in and so I think it's worth saying, obviously, 33 different sites spread across the whole appellation. Um, some are quite big, some are quite small. Um, some are quite heavily or, or densely planted and some, some others, obviously, like Ronca, are, are less so. Um, I think, as, as Ola said before, it, it is a, a fabulous opportunity to create wines that are very distinctive from, from one another. Um, I think what I'd like to, to really do now is talk about some of the, the technical uh, aspects of what makes a crew wine and, you know, and ultimately how will we see them labeled. And then perhaps after that, we can go on to talk about, talk about style 
um, you know, the style of the wines in the glass. Um, first, per perhaps we could start then by um, showing you this question, which I think is quite a good technical question. Um, I can answer. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, fire away. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you, Fabian. Uh, okay, we have 33 crews that are officially recognized in our specification, so you find 33 of them. And for the 2019 vintage, there were 23 uh, that was re vindicati, so that was asked to, to be made uh, in, um, by, by the wineries. So we find 23 different crews on the labels from uh, vintage 2019. That is a very, very good uh, percentage uh, for, for, for the first year. And uh, so that, 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 that was uh, a press release of a couple of weeks ago. So um, that's the reason why someone asked me about the 23 and the 33. <laughs> I know it because I've answered to that question a lot of times. So yes, for the 2019 vintage, we will find 23 crews on the labels on the shelves. Okay, and so let's talk for a minute. Ola, I believe that um, we're potentially looking at 50 or 60 wines. It's, it's unclear yet, um, but you know, on average, maybe each winery might have vineyard parcels in, in um, you know, a couple of different crew sites. This is pretty good, right, for the, for the consumer? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. The, the, let's leave it uh, to Matteo to talk about uh, how many crews there are uh, on the labels and 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 what people are doing with them. But just essentially to answer the 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 very simple question you were putting there, this is great, right? Having uh, having the possibility to go into depth of uh, vineyard expression uh, that transcends winemaking and that. Uh, is is a matter of uh, is a matter of the 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 place coming through in the wine. I think is great. I think that's what the wine buying public is looking for more and more in the world. I mean, you can copy everything in the world of wine except the place. The place is it. So the more place, the better. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's pretty simple for me. Okay, so if I could, Mate, I'm going to bring you in. You, you obviously have two different. Um, crew vineyards um you've you your family has been um pioneering these names for for quite a few years now do you think it's going to take other producers a while before they really get behind this um it's it's a quite long process uh to identify uh, uh the uh, real identity of crew vineyards because first of all, you need to um, develop a proper viticulture and saying, I have a good viticulture is something, but developing a viticulture that is able to emphasize the characteristic of a crew, it's, it's just a, a, a long process. You need to <laughs> try, you need to invest, and you need to taste the wines. So um, the more a crew have a strong identity, the more it's easy. Uh, then some, uh, even in the same crew, we can see some plots which uh, are giving uh, uh, a batch of wine, which uh, which is more, for example, on the Foscarino, more dense and more with the characteristics of the of the, the main characteristics. And other other batches, other plots, they have maybe a kind of lava which is more like sandy. And there, maybe we can see the wines are um, a bit lighter. So it's it's. I think it's it's going back a bit to what Burgundy did uh, centuries ago. You need to start to divide the different parcels and do vinification of the different parcels in the crew. So at that stage, you you can divide the ones which are more expressive and you can blend them together. Uh, we did this very carefully only in the last 10 years. Before was... Um, you, you still feel Foscarino, for example, has this uh, very rich uh, um, uh, body, respect to many other Suaves, and uh, the, the, the aromatic compounds are also quite strong. Uh, 
so I, again, I think every winery is responsible for the identity of the crew. Uh, talking about, for example, the difference between uh, Carbonare, which is a very fresh site uh, compared to Foscarino, which is uh, more warm, more windy. These two uh, crew we do are very, very opposite one to another. So it's, it's quite easy to see the, the difference um, between the two sides. Carbo uh, Foscarino is more, I call it a panettone, is, is a big cake facing the plane and it's very windy and it's, it's a bit drier. So you, you have um, a wine which is very concentrated naturally. The wind is uh, lowing down the bigger of the plants and the productions are lower, the vigor is lower, uh, whereas in the Carbonare you have uh, less wind and more water in the rocks. When it's raining, after the rain, uh, you can see the water coming out from the rocks for many, many days. And also the gap of uh, um, temperature between day and night in the Carbonare is, is better in, than the Foscarino, for example. Now with the global warming, looks like very east facing facing uh, plots and uh, very uh, more protected from the air of the plane are giving very interesting results and carbonari is very special is 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 a very niche in the suave classico you have more this kind of citrus aroma and a very acid mineral uh, compound which links together like foscarino is a bit more tannic more phenolic more structure Carbonara is a bit uh, a more longer wine, more vertical wine. Um, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and also the, the way you produce the wine can, uh, can show the wines differently. So for example, in a site where we have more freshness, we tend to emphasize the freshness. So we do no malolactic and we, we, do, uh, uh, we put a bit of sulfites, not too much before the maceration, uh, before we press. Uh, in the Foscarino, for example, we, we don't do that. So we emphasize the body and the largeness of the wine. Uh, it's, it's a mix of combination. Definitely, the, the, the way the global warming is influencing uh, makes always like Italian white wines lack of uh, acidity and freshness. So we really need to protect this aspect uh, through a proper uh, vinification and also for a proper viticulture. So like working the soil and managing very well the, the pruning system. It's, it's, it's a challenge which Suave is doing very well and I think uh, all the producers are growing year by year. And so it's just tasting and comparing the labels that you can, you can feel these different prospects. Yeah, Chiara, I mean, do you agree? I mean, winemaking style is obviously very important here um, and we're also at the beginning, really, um, certainly in comparison with Burgundy, we're, we're at the beginning of a, of a long journey of discovery into the, the different microclimates of each site. But, you know, do you, do you think there should be a, a unified style here or is it up to the producer to choose, you know, their level of patinage, their level of malolactic fermentation, the oak, for example? I think you should ask this question to Ole, which uh, uh, <laughs> is uh, a buyer and a seller, <laughs> because uh, I mean I can uh, I can I can tell you what uh, I think about uh, how to deal with uh, crews and uh, with. Uh, so, um, and uh, I'm convinced uh, since uh, ever uh, that. Uh, I think uh, uh, you should uh, try to uh, uh, take uh, uh, what uh, your terroir uh, gives you, um, no matter what uh, the market uh, asks for. Uh, and uh, even though I'm uh, the sales manager of my <laughs> winery, so <laughs> I should probably say something different. Um, but um, yes. I think uh, one of uh, the best uh, and the most uh, particular thing about uh, wines uh, is uh, uh, where it comes from uh, first. 
and as Ole said, uh, uh, you know, the play, you can't move the place. Um, so once you have the place uh, and uh, once you learn how to deal with that uh, and uh, to work that, uh, then uh, of course uh, there's also the winemaker's uh, hand, <laughs> um, but, uh, but uh, still uh, it's something that uh, you, as Matteo said, uh, develop uh, in many different years with many different uh, experiments. Um, we can talk about, uh, for example, so the grapes uh, that uh, were added uh, first in the Suave, so when uh, Chardonnay was added, uh, now it's no more added, uh, or uh, things like that. Uh, so we were, for example, I think one of the first ones uh, to plant, well, probably the first ones uh, to plant Chardonnay in our area, and now, and then we have been the first ones uh, to take it out from the Suave Classico. Um, so it's uh, it's really a combination of uh, uh, the place and the winemaker. And then if the winemaker wants to follow the market or to follow his or her heart, then uh, uh, I think uh, every state uh, has a different answer for this. As Julia said, uh, um, also for us it's very important uh, to uh, keep uh, the ecosystem uh, as much as possible uh, as it was. So there's vineyards, uh, but uh, we also have uh, woods, uh, we have uh, uh, hawthorns, uh, we have uh, olive trees, we have cherry trees, uh, uh, and uh, we have been the first uh, winery in the Suave Classical region to be certified organic. Uh, and uh, we are still uh, certified organic. I'm not sure we will be in the future uh, because uh, in Italy is uh, really lots of papers. And uh, but uh, I think uh, mm, the best thing you can do first uh, is uh, your uh, uh, soil and your land uh, as good as possible. Brilliant. Well, yeah. I mean. The, the classic wine uh, winery response there, Ola style. You have some I, I so the, there are two answers basically to uh, the question of what do we want? Do we want different winemaking styles? Do we want the same winemaking style to highlight highlight the terroir? One is the sort of nerdy wine writer kind of thing, and the other is the sort of if you want the wine cellar thing. And then it depends on what type of wine cellar you are. Now, if you if if you want to sell wine, it depends very much what market you're in, right? Uh, let's not forget that when I grew up, this is a long time ago, right? But when I grew up 40 years ago, um, uh, Suave was a thin little Italian white wine that you bought in two liter bottles in the supermarket. Uh, and Suave has come a very, very long way, right? It's called Magnum now. <laughs> it's called, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it costs Special a little bit more. Well. It costs a little bit more, <laughs> but but that is great because a place like Suave has been making wine for two thousand years, right? At yes. least uh, there is a history. There is a reason why that's the case, and Suave was raped to produce uh, 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 large amounts of consumer wine. I don't think a small area the way Suave is now with the potential for quality that Suave has really is all that well suited to make a mass market wine. You can do that in the plains in Australia. You can do that in the plains of Italy for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but here we're talking about hills. But, but again, the concept of vineyards, of course, is a niche concept. It's a concept for a small part of the, of the, of the denomination. Uh, and so on. So there will still be Suave that's sold at relatively uh, reasonable prices around the world. But uh, but the work of putting vineyards in there is um, and, and have that be part of the mix will be a, a work that will also lift the level of Suave, uh, not just um, in terms of uh, consumers' uh, vision of what Suave is, but it can help the entire area lift its level as well. Um, uh, just the general level. There is some great wine being made, of course, already now. The the nerdy answer is the more different styles, the more different vineyards, 
the more different interpretations we can have, the better, because then we can nerd uh, about that seriously and for a long time, which is great. And one of the things that you nerd a lot about when you're drinking good burgundy, for instance, which I like, right, <laughs> is you have exactly the same vineyard, exactly the same vintage, but you have five different producers, right? And then you sit down and taste and you try to find out not only what are the differences, but also what are the similarities. And that's one of the great things that you can have. And, and so for the nerdy part of your brain, right? Uh, having different styles and different uh, vineyards, that, uh, especially if you can have several different winemakers make wine from the same general vineyard area, it gives rise to endless, really interesting discussions. Yes. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to following that for the future for Swab. Yeah, I think that's, that's an excellent point. And I think, um, Ju Julia, it's, you obviously haven't previously uh, really promoted your, your crew on your, your labels, have you? You've never used, um, you know, Ronca, uh, you know, to, to promote the origin of your, your wine. But um, La Capolina, for example, that, am I right in saying that will ultimately become your, your winery's crew wine? Um, currently, I produce two Soave wines. Uh, one, La Capellina, uh, that you introduced, uh, which come from the vineyards that we have in uh, Ronca Cru, Ronca Monte Calvarina Cru, and especially Monte Crocetta. That is the uh, first Soave that we produced at the very beginning of, my, of, of our winery. And then we introduced another Soave, Recorbian, which is um, produced in a part of the vineyards inside the Ronca Cru and another part right, the, uh, right uh, outside the, the Cru Ronca, but very, very close to it, um, which is in the lower part of the, the village Terrosa. So that is, it can't be a crew because it is outside. But it is maybe um, a little bit more important because it, can, it it arrives after two years of aging. So they are very two very different wines. But if I have to choose a wine that can express uh, the soil, the terroir, the landscape, uh, what Ronca Cru um, taste in the wine, for sure I present you um, La Capellina from my winery. Because for me, even if it is a wine that it, usually we, we enjoy to drink in one, two years of age, you can then keep, keep it for many years. We also organize with the, the Suave Consortio um, a tasting, which is Suave 7, where we present uh, all the wineries present the current vintage and then from the same label the um, uh, the seven years old vintage so seven or older so it is very very interesting to see the development the development of the wines uh, but we really enjoy to drink it when it is quite young because it is really able to show you um, the soil from which the grapes come from and also the um, the taste of the Garganega uh, when it is young. So in particular, uh, in our crew, we have um, very, at the nose it presents a very fresh, very fresh with a hint of exotic fruits, I'd like to say like mango. Um, so it is really, really expressive to the nose. Uh, and then in the mouth, we, re uh, we found again the same aromas, but together with a very, nice minerality and then of course it is a personal taste there are people that enjoy and are other people that don't like of course uh, but we personally love these characteristics so this minerality combined with the acidity of the grape uh, which makes the wines re the wine really fresh and really enjoyable to drink so uh, i totally agree with dole when uh, in saying that to get to today um we can copy we can copy a lot of things, but uh, we can't reproduce the characteristic of a soil. So we can bring the grapes uh, in another place, but you will never have the same uh, result that you have here because we have this particular combination of grapes, soil, 
uh, climate and of course the, the, the hand of the winemaker uh, that gives this particular uh, result, these particular wines. And I am really, really happy also to, to have born here in the Suave area because uh, we are growing a lot. We are a very nice group. We are um, a very nice group of people with a lot of friends. So we also uh, exchange a lot of ideas. We speak together a lot. We also uh, taste together wines in order to try to understand where we can um, improve. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I think I think for me, one of the you know, as you briefly alluded to, one of the um, hallmarks of great wine um, is the the longevity of it and its ability to age and improve over yes. time. Um, Garganega, in recent years, now that there's a little bit of uh, yield control and a little bit more understanding of the variety, seems to be a variety that can age, and, you know, and develop and and take on all these, you know, very complex tertiary flavors and aromas, yes. um, and and obviously. Brilliant that you mention, um, you know, the the new group of people that are going to take um, Suave through the next generation. Um, presumably, you're looking forward to to putting some of these wines in the cellar and bringing them out in 10, 20, maybe years time. Yes, absolutely. Uh, all the wineries, I think, are, are, are doing things like this. There are uh, wine, wineries that are um, with a longer history that has a uh, cellar with very uh, aged, very uh, old vintages. And it is always interesting to open an old bottle, an old vintage, to compare and also to see how the wine uh, develops in the time. Uh, personally, uh, we open, uh, sometimes we do some vertical tasting, so we open some old vintages. Um, we started with the very, very first vintage in 2002, uh, but I have bottles from 2005. Uh, we opened, uh, I think we started to do vertical tasting two years ago because of the Suave 7 tasting with the Suave Consortium. So we said, okay, let's try. I absolutely don't know what I will find inside the bottle. Uh, also because when uh, my father started, uh, for sure, it, uh, it didn't produce wines with the idea, okay, this wine, we have to last for many, many, many years. It was because that were the first vintages. So it's okay if it is good for the first or second year and then it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so. The wines that we produce now, uh, we work in a better way in the winery. We have more more experience back, so uh, they are developing developing better and better. From when we opened in 2005 and in particular in 2007, we were really like, wow, it's impossible. This is my wine. <laughs> it's, 2005 is still like this. Of course, it, it is different from the younger wine because we don't, uh, have the same aromas. We have a more uh, matured wine, more with more ripe aromas and, and perfumes, uh, but the same minerality, the same freshness, quite the same freshness. Um, something that really um, make us think really wow. Uh, it, Garganica is simply amazing because you really, uh, if you open a bottle of the same wine, the same vintage year by year, you will find a little something different uh, every time so i think it's really really interesting to to emphasize what we have so the garganega the grapes that we have in this now are very particular soils uh, and then have to see how it developed in the years mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um mateo i'd i'd like to ask you about your your back vintages i think i was buying buying a Foscarino wines from Carve de Perrin in the UK about 10, 12 years ago. Um, so I, I mean, I know, I know you've, um, I've had a chance to taste some of them after five or six years, but how far do your, do your vintage, vintages go back now in, in your, in your stocks, in your library? Actually with the Suave, we can go back to the nineties. But uh, the, the more you go back, the more is every bottle can change. Because at that time, for example, um, th this is happening with Burgundy wines as well. Every cork is different. 
and uh, every cork can generate a little bit different tertiarization of the wine so the, the oxidative uh, uh, phase can, can take a wine more into one direction or another so you always look for the wine which is fresher of course because normally it's more expressive but uh, yeah we can we can go back to to the 90s um, what we learn in Inama is also the the way you act in the winery depending on the vintage can really make a difference and uh, this we can only taste now after 20 years so that's why in France they say the first hundred years are very difficult but then gets better <laughs> um, it's really true you you need to wait so many years to understand uh, also the way you did an interpretation of the vintage because you know you when when you when you have a, a good raw material it's always good i mean you will also have a good wine but uh, the little details the way you cook it can really lead to uh, after 20 years to to a different wine so yeah we are still learning we are learning so much we're learning so much and the, the only way is to taste can i ask, can I ask about, um, um, the varieties obviously garganega must um, represents at least 75 70 of the blend um trebbiano di suave what does it bring um why do some producers not use it at all what what do we think ola any thoughts Trebbiano di Suave is, is a great grape variety. It's Verdicchio, more or less, yeah, right? Absolutely. And Verdicchio makes some of the most interesting terroir uh, uh, wines that can age for a long time as well in another mm -hmm. part of Italy. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not so sure that the grape variety discussion is so important in, in the sense that, um, first of all, we're talking about uh, single vineyards here. But secondly, what we're looking for is the expression of the place. And the expression of that place can come through one or the other grape variety. The grape variety is going to um, interpret it, as it were, di slightly differently. Uh, but, but for me, uh, apart from those being great grape varieties, um, uh, I, I think the really interesting part is the interpretation of the place. It's the, it's the place that comes through the grape variety that's interesting rather than the grape variety that dominates the place that's for me is 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 the holy grail if you want right i mean uh, I, i'm sorry to keep referring to burgundy but if you look at burgundy chardonnay is actually a fairly neutral grape variety the glory of chardonnay is that it it takes the place and puts it in front and i think that the same goes for many of italy's greatest uh, white wine grape varieties uh, we are talking about the likes of Trebbiano di Suave or Verdicchio. We're talking Garganega. Uh, we're, 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 we could be talking about uh, Fiano. Uh, we could be talking about Vermentino and so on. These are great varieties. They, they do have their own character, as does Chardonnay. But it's not a big, shouty character. It's a character that lets the place shine through. And I think that that is really important. And, and, and that is the, the holy grail, as I said. And can I just say one thing? I'm, um, uh, I'm on a mission here in my own little wine importing business uh, to persuade everyone in, in Denmark, at least, that Italy makes some of the world's greatest uh, and most long lived white wines. And Italy does. It makes it in Suave, it makes it in uh, uh, Castelli di Iesi, it makes it in Irpinia, it makes it uh, in Sardinia, uh, and so on and so forth. The, the notion that Italy doesn't have the grape varieties and the terroirs to make great wines, great white wines that improve with time in bottle, even uh, until the wines are 20 or 30 years old, is just simply wrong. And, and unfortunately, it's not just us outside of Italy that think this. It is also many, many, even many producers in Italy have this minority complex about that. And they have to grow out of it. I, uh, I mean, these wines are glorious when they're 15, 20 years old. And, and the, the, the minerality aspect that Julia mentions, uh, you know, from a volcanic soil such as ours, I, I've never tasted your wine, I'm sorry. But I'm sure that, uh, you know, with 15, 20 years of age, the minerality component is huge. It has an enormous impact, right? It's like a great Riesling. And... Uh, 
And that is, uh, I think the minerality obviously is a function of where the wine has grown. Uh, so, uh, so the more of that you can get, the better. I think the basic point I want to make is Italy makes great white wines. Suave makes great white wines that can live for a long time and improve in the bottle. And uh, I think that we're just at the beginning of the world understanding just how good it can be. You all give me a, um, a very good inspiration or something important to talk about, uh, which is a great variety against uh, terroir. Uh, we also made a newsletter in Inama that you can read on the website, which is, you know, talking about this, you know, are we talking about grey variety or are we talking about terroir? Um, what uh, we see in the Suave is that uh, Garganega is playing more like the more neutral. Uh, it, it's anyway very floral, uh, um, but like uh, Trebbiano, it tends to be... We don't grow t Trebbiano, but I, I go around the vineyards and I taste the wines, and I feel a bit more in the first phase is more like varietal. You have this kind of peach, tropical, very primary presence in the wine, which and, then- And green herbs, and herbs as, well. as well. And green herbs, which are standing very, there is a bit like uh, other grey varieties uh, like Sauvignon, where is a, that, that touch of greenness, it's really easy to get, that type of herbaceous. And, um, but it's really interesting to see how the terroir comes later. So the more the years go on, the more these characteristics, they go down and you feel more the minerality of the soils. So it's, it's interesting uh, to taste a suave with a, a Trebbiano blend and see how it ages. And uh, I can recognize Trebbiano immediately in a suave. So when, especially when they're young, which uh, can be not like uh, for a nerd. I mean, it's like varietal. I can recognize. It's like when you say, I, ah, it's Sauvignon. And people tell you, ah, it can be grown everywhere. You always taste with that kind of green notes. That's not true. It's all about uh, man and terroir. Uh, so it's really interesting to, to evaluate uh, these uh, prospects. And I think uh, it's true. It's, it's like a verdicchio de Trebbiano. But is uh, in the primary flavors is acting a bit differently in the suave because where, when you move a grape, it's it's acting differently. Um, but yeah, the, the garganega tends to be very floral, and when it ages, goes into a kind of marzipan, in a kind of almondy dry flower, and and the trebbiano it's more fruity, brings more fruit. So even this combination of grapes can lead to different interpretation of a crew. A lot of different factors at play here. I mean, clearly Suave is a, is a hugely complex area of study, never, never mind the wine. We've got, um, you know, we've got the, the, the volcanic soil versus, um, you know, the, the clay and the limestone areas. We've got, we've got the, um, the influence of, of altitude and, uh, you know, the, the different exposures of the, of the vineyards. We've got the, the influence of, you know, Matteo's Panatoni Valleys, if, if you like. We've got the, the two different varieties of Trebbiano, Di Suave and Garganega. There's no way we can cover everything in, in a single discussion. No. <laughs> every, every discussion, every single um, exchange we've had so far, I think, leads down another alleyway of, of, of quite exciting um, information. And so I, I think for me, this is, a, this is really great news that, that Suave has taken this, this step, you know, even though um, there are many people out there that would say they've been drinking this kind of Suave for years, um, I think it's still important to officially make the decision that, that there are these different vineyards and they all provide these different characteristics. And it's important to, to use that as a footing to go forward with. Consorzio Chiara. Uh, <laughs> it's my name and surname, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you obviously have a, a wonderful job and a very difficult job. I mean, where do, you, where do you go from here? You have this region that is being compared in some way to Burgundy. Um, yeah. There are clearly similarities. There are, there are differences. You've got to promote the concept of, of quality, um, but you have producers that are obviously free to, to go their own way and do their own, do their own thing in the cellar. How... How do you bring it all together? Yeah, it's it's a it's a 
very variegated world because we have 83 associated. So, and uh, uh, that actually we are 160 producers of suave wine. And uh, so, so many uh, souls that are inside the consortium. And uh, our, uh, our main mission would be for the future to communicate the suave wine as a, we can say a, as a, a great red wine of Italy. So uh, the introduction of the crew and the single vineyard as well, because we, we have the single vineyards. Uh, so little plots that would be uh, um, in a certain way uh, evalu um, enhanced uh, with, the, with, the new, with the new quality system. And uh, the new generation, you see, we uh, we are young. <laughs> we, are, we, we were we were young, but, but, but we are young, and uh, no, but we have a lot of producers from the third generation, so nearly thirty to forty years old. So mm -hmm. with with that, with the new uh, awareness of the world, of the market, on uh, on on how things are going in the world, so competition is really hard. But I think that, as Julia said, with a, with a, a, a strong group that works together, that, that make uh, the, 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 the taste together uh, and the respect the differences. With, as Matteo said, with the history and uh, the qualification of viticulture, we have a lot of, of projects. I'm here with Chiara, but we have a lot of projects on research and development, on, um, on a hill viticulture. So, viticulture on the, on the uh, <laughs> uh, for, um, for viticulture on the gradients for uh, uh, using less herbicides that uh, has less uh, pesticide in the vineyard. So, uh, for sustainability, Suave has become in 2018 uh, global important agricultural system for the UN FAO, and we are the 52 sites in the world, and that from FAO means a sustainable place. Uh, both for environment, social, and economic, because we have a system of cooperatives uh, that makes uh, uh, 2,500 uh, people, family live on wine. And that's the most important thing, I think. So it's a very complex system, and we want to enhance uh, the, the awareness and, uh, and, and the job that, that our viticulture do every day. So that, that's our job, our mission. It's, it's easy, I say. <laughs> it's easy, but we, we, are, we are strong. After a few bottles of wine. Uh, mm. The future, uh, no, I know that, that the, this, this was the year of the cruise, and, uh, but it became the year of the coronavirus. <laughs> but we uh, just stopped the promotion. We just suspended, but we are going to, to start again, uh, we hope, very soon. And uh, we... We want to be stronger than, than ever. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Guys, closing comments. Um, Ola. Yeah, can I just say what, what a pleasure to, to sit with uh, such articulate people on their own terroirs. And uh, uh, it is, I mean, as if it wasn't already clear, the future of Suave is really great. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> This time together made me feel I really want to taste uh, more suave, so I'm looking forward <laughs> yeah, to go yeah. home and have my <laughs> by myself uh, aperitivo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been a very eye-opening um, discussion, um, certainly very engaging. I'm very keen as soon as this terrible lockdown um, ends to get to get over to um, to the suave region and get out in the vineyards and, and start tasting again. Very much looking forward to doing the geeky, nerdy side of things and, and comparing one against the other. Um, yeah, big thank you once again. Have have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. And thank you. you. Thank you. Nice you. Okay. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you.